Good evening. Thanks for joining me for this webinar about nutritional support for bone density. I'm Andrea Bartels, and I'm a registered nutritional therapist. I'm also the new lead educator for Pure Lab Vitamins. Tonight, I'm going to provide a bit of a primer on nutrition and bone density and the condition osteoporosis. Some of the questions I'll answer during the presentation include, what are the risk factors for osteoporosis? What dietary strategies support bone density? And what nutritional supplementation can be used for bone density support? This webinar is not just for those diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia. It's also for anyone who wants to maintain their bone health. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box available on your Zoom screen's menu bar. After the presentation, I'll be joined by Cyrus Kuzarani, our founder and formulator. And together, we'll be answering your questions related to bone density support. I'll also be sharing my Bone Builder smoothie recipe, so please stick around for that. I'd like to begin by identifying some bone basics. The adult human skeleton has over 200 bones. Together, their major functions include structural support, mobility, protection of vital organs, mineral storage, and also blood cell production. Specifically, the manufacture of blood platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells called B lymphocytes is happening in the bone marrow. You may not feel your bones doing all this for you, but bone is living metabolically active tissue. Structurally, what are our bones composed of? They're made of collagen, that's a protein, as well as calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, and trace minerals. You might already know that these are alkaline minerals. They form the cement on the web of protein that forms bone. Think of a block of concrete. If you think of bones as reinforced concrete, it's the calcium, phosphorus, and other minerals that provide the cement. And collagen forms the reinforcing rods. Richly mineralized bone is able to resist fracture because it is stronger bone. I mentioned that bone is metabolically active tissue, but what does this mean? Bone is constantly being remodeled, like all tissues. To build anything, you need a construction crew, right? Osteoblasts are bone cells that build new bone, working together like a construction crew. Like with any building structure, repairs are needed and parts replaced. Osteoclasts are bone cells that tear down old bone, like a demolition crew. Here's a quick rundown on how the bone remodeling process works. Your osteoblasts manufacture collagen, that's a protein. Now, a mineral compound called calcium phosphate attaches to the collagen. Then, crystallization of calcium and other minerals can occur. Now that the mineral is attached to the collagen structure, it forms what is called hydroxyapatite. This hydroxyapatite is a complex of calcium, phosphorus, proteins, and bone growth factors. Hydroxyapatite is what gives bones their strength and mass. Then you have the construction and demolition crews. Like all cells, old bone cells must be replaced gradually by new ones. So the osteoclasts release acids and enzymes to demolish old cells. The old bone dissolves and minerals within them are released back into blood for other uses. It's a slow process, this remodeling, but imagine, over an average lifetime, your skeleton gets fully replaced 10 times. Now for a few serious stats. Females reach up to 90% of peak bone mass by age 18, while boys reach this by age 20. This is why childhood and adolescent nutrition is so crucial for bone health. Otherwise, if we begin life with low bone density, we can expect to see a higher risk of osteoporosis and fracture later in life. Osteoporosis is a word used by doctors when your bone density test shows your bone density is significantly lower than other individuals of your age, sex, and race. The condition takes years, probably decades, to develop and leads to fractures in 50% of women over 65. As a woman, your lifetime risk of fracturing a hip is 1 in 6. Compare this to the risk of breast cancer, which is 1 in 9 in Canada. Sadly, one in four women who fracture a vertebra will fracture another within a year. In fact, just 10% loss of bone mass in the vertebrae or hip bones can double the risk of fracture. 
It's normal to see some gradual loss of bone density after menopause. But why is this? Bone mass peaks around age 18, but begins to fall gradually starting in our 20s. But by the time women reach their 40s, the decrease in estrogen and progesterone production reduces the ability to construct new bone. Meanwhile, the demolition of bone cells stays active. So there's this imbalance, making the demolition process the dominant process. By the time a woman has reached menopause, she has next to no estrogen or progesterone production. This can result in a bone density loss of 2 to 3% per year from menopause onwards. Osteoporosis is a silent disease. It's sometimes accompanied by a change in posture, putting pressure on the lungs and GI organs, and sometimes pain is felt, but it is often completely asymptomatic. Here's what can happen once you have osteoporosis. Bone fracture. Hip fracture often has a poor prognosis, mainly because of the health risks of a long convalescence. Of course, this depends on the general health of the individual. An infection like pneumonia is easier to catch and more difficult to fight during an extended hospital stay. Sadly, sometimes this can be fatal in the elderly or immunocompromised individuals. And that's why the Osteoporosis Society has called the disease a silent killer. In order to maintain healthy, mineral-dense bones, we need balanced nutrition and exercise of the right kind. There are two main nutritional approaches to bone health. The most widely recommended dietary approach is to consume enough high calcium foods to add calcium to the bone mineral matrix. Calcium is an alkaline mineral found in various foods, with the highest sources being milk and fortified milk substitute products, sardines or salmon with bones, tahini, and dark greens. By the way, you need to eat the fish bones to get the calcium. I'm not ordinarily a fan of canned foods, but this is one instance where canned may be a better choice than fresh. And in order to maximize bioavailability of the calcium in vegetables, you're best to ferment or cook them first. That's because the oxalates that naturally occur in high calcium plants will bind to the calcium, locking it up and making it more difficult for you to absorb from that food. What I've always found interesting is that osteoporosis tends to be a disease of industrialized nations where there's already high consumption of calcium and processed foods. The Nurses Health Study examined the diets of nearly 80,000 American nurses over a period of over two decades. One of the findings that came out of this research was rather surprising. Women who drank two or more glasses of milk daily had a 45% increased occurrence of hip fracture when compared to women consuming less than one glass per week. A Swedish study of more than 60,000 women and 45,000 men showed similar results. It found women who drank three or more glasses of milk per day died at nearly twice the rate of those who drank less than one glass per day. The conclusion they made was higher milk consumption is not protective against fracture or death. Before going any further, I want to acknowledge that cow's milk has been shown to be very beneficial to bone development during childhood and adolescence, when bones are still growing. But a higher dairy product intake is not associated with higher bone mineral density in adult women. That's because there's more to building and maintaining bone than just calcium. I'll speak more about this in a bit. Several studies also show that high intakes of sugar, salt, animal protein, and refined oils are associated with lower bone mineral density. What do these foods have in common? Well, each of these dietary components are acid forming to the tissues. That's because they're poor sources of water and they're low in vitamins and minerals that support proper pH. Normal metabolic activities generate acidic waste products that are toxic. Acid is corrosive and must be excreted by the body. But thanks to our bone mineral reservoirs, we are protected from the life-threatening effects of acid overload in the bloodstream. You see, the body will take alkaline minerals from the bones to buffer the acids in the blood in order to save the cells from acid poisoning. It's a nice feature when we first consider it. But what happens if this becomes a chronic process that is needed day in and day out for years, decades of our lives? This acid rain will gradually dissolve the minerals out of our bones. Bones become depleted of their mineral stores, 
which reduces their density, and ultimately their strength and resistance to fracture. That's why I feel consuming enough alkaline forming foods to protect our bone mineral reservoirs makes a lot of sense. These foods include fruits and vegetables. Higher intakes of vegetables and protein are actually both associated with higher bone mineral density. Vegetables offer up the minerals needed to buffer the acids we generate and provide water to dilute them. Of course, we can't just live on fruits and vegetables as they are a poor source of protein, but they must be a major part of our diet in order to keep our bone mineral stores in the bone bank, so to speak. Just a reminder that our daily goal for fruit and vegetable intake is eight to 10 servings per day. But what's a serving? It's half a cup. I bet that's less than you thought. So eight to 10 servings is just four to five cups of fruit and vegetables each day. Are you achieving this goal every day? With today's busy lifestyles, it can be challenging to meet both our calcium intake goals and our dietary goals. After considering that, is nutritional supplementation necessary to build and protect bone density? First, I ask these questions. Do you eat processed foods? Do you follow a vegan diet? Do you work or spend most of your time indoors? Do you have a malabsorption disorder like celiac or Crohn's? Do you have a history of using corticosteroid medications? Are you small framed with a petite bone structure? Do you find it difficult to exercise regularly and is it weight bearing exercise or resistance training? Have you been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis? Do you live in Canada? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then yes, nutritional supplementation is essential to maintaining your bone density. Let's look at some of the most important nutritional supplements for bone density support. The first one I want to include on my checklist is our AlkaPure pH. I spoke earlier about pH and how diet plays a role in managing our bone mineral stores. I mentioned that a high intake of processed foods creates excess acid and must be buffered by alkaline minerals. These minerals include calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, and must come from the diet. Otherwise, they are withdrawn from the bones, gradually reducing their mineral density and strength. Pure Lab's AlkaPure pH promotes proper pH of the tissues and cells, reducing the acidic effects of stress, poor diet, and inactivity on our body. AlkaPure pH provides potassium, sodium, and magnesium in forms that the body uses to buffer acids. That way, undesirable mineral deposits and mineral losses in the urine are reduced. Along with both of these beneficial changes, we also often see reduced inflammation in the joints, the skin, and muscles that can result from these undesirable mineral deposits. AlkaPure pH is a pH supportive formula. It is sodium and potassium balanced, allowing nutrients and water to flow into the cells and waste to be flushed out of our cells. Initially, in a hyperacidic body, we recommend three capsules of AlkaPure pH twice daily to flush out acid from our tissues. If you have any additional chronic inflammatory conditions like arthritis, for example, you might notice that you gradually see a reduction in joint pain through this process. Our suggested maintenance dose is just two capsules twice daily on an empty stomach. Remember, AlkaPure pH is designed to counteract over acidity in the blood and tissues. And because it does that, we aim to protect the bones from having to dump their mineral stores to do the same. Now that we've covered the importance of pH in bone density, let's talk about some individual nutrients that are critical for bone health. One of these is vitamin D3. The technical name for vitamin D is calciferol. It's a fat-soluble, hormone-like vitamin that regulates calcium levels in the blood for calcium deposition into bone. Without it, our bones would become soft and the weight-bearing ones will actually bend as a result of vitamin D deficiency. When this happens in adults, the condition is called osteomalacia. Now take note of the difference between osteomalacia and osteoporosis. They're not the same thing. Osteomalacia is the softening of the bones due to chronic vitamin D deficiency. 
Osteoporosis involves increased porosity of the bones and usually involves more than this. In industrialized countries, osteomalacia is less common than osteoporosis, but both conditions can lead to fracture. It's rather interesting, and probably not a coincidence, that the highest rates of osteoporosis occur in countries with the highest latitude on the globe. The further north from the equator, the higher the prevalence of the disease. Why is that? The answer has to do with sun exposure. In cold climates like Canada and countries like Northern Europe, we live indoors for much of the year. And when outdoors, many of us wear sunblock and that reduces our skin's production of vitamin D. With insufficient amounts of vitamin D over the long term, we see many health effects, including reduced bone density. So in Canada, we need to maintain our blood levels of vitamin D year round. But how much is enough? How much you need is dependent on your blood results. In Ontario, for about $40, you can have your vitamin D levels checked at any Life Labs or Dynacare lab. What you're aiming for is a blood level of 150 nanomoles per liter, the optimal level for disease prevention. For some individuals, this is as simple as taking 1000 IU of vitamin D3 daily. For others, they may initially require much more. Test often. Ask your primary health care provider for several requisition forms so you can get tested every month at first to see if your vitamin D dose is high enough to reach that 150 nanomoles per liter. This number is recommended by vitamin D experts Reinhold Viath, PhD, and Michael Hollick, MD, who conducted exhaustive population studies. But be mindful of the fact that high levels of vitamin D can demineralize if calcium intake is insufficient. Pure Lab Vitamin D3 is available in 1000 IU and 2500 IU capsules. The vitamin D we use is sourced from New Zealand wool wax. For those who prefer to avoid animal derived ingredients, we have our vegan vitamin D 1000 unit. This one is sourced from lichen and has been approved by the Vegan Society. For all three of our vitamin D3 products, Pure Lab uses a dry, crystalline powder form of vitamin D3. This form has a longer lasting potency than oil-filled vitamin D capsules, which tend to go rancid and lose their potency more easily. Then there's calcium. The recommended daily calcium intake is 1000 milligrams, but 1500 milligrams for osteoporotic individuals. Think about those factors I listed earlier, like consumption of processed foods or a vegan diet. Is your diet providing enough calcium consistently day after day? This is important since over 40% of healthy bone mass is calcium, where it's found in the form of calcium phosphate. Remember, part of calcium's job is to add strength to bones so they can resist fracture. Pure Lab's calcium hydroxyapatite is an organically bound calcium complex with the built-in benefits of minerals and proteins that are naturally occurring in the bone matrix. Proteins, bone growth factors, calcium, phosphorus, trace minerals, and more. Together, these are needed for the formation and maintenance of healthy bones and teeth. Calcium hydroxyapatite has greater bioavailability than calcium citrate and calcium carbonate with more of each dose absorbed into circulation. Unlike calcium citrate, it does not contribute to your total acid load. Pure Lab's calcium hydroxyapatite contains only high-grade, certified BSE-free Australian bovine bone meal as its source material. Each capsule contains 250 milligrams of pure elemental calcium. With this, you can achieve 50% of your daily requirements in as little as two capsules or 100% of your needs in four capsules. Meanwhile, some calcium products have so little calcium per capsule that more than six pills must be taken daily to reach your daily goal. I don't know about you, but I'd rather take fewer capsules of a product whenever possible. Remember, if you do consume milk products or calcium fortified non-dairy milk substitutes, factor this into your daily calcium total. Be sure to consider your healthcare practitioner's recommendations as well. One of the most exciting nutrients in bone health that I'd like to talk about next is vitamin K. 
In fact, low blood levels of vitamin K in humans are also associated with osteopenia and osteoporosis. Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin that actually exists in several forms. The main ones are K1 and K2. I'm going to talk about K2 as it's the one most relevant to bone health. There are actually two main forms of K2, MK4 and MK7. I'll compare these in a minute. Vitamin K2 is vital for the production of osteocalcin, a protein that calcium crystallizes onto. Its presence reduces the release of calcium into the urine by as much as 50%. Vitamin K2 increases the activity and numbers of bone building cells, those osteoblasts, and reduces bone resorption by reducing activity of osteoclasts. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of reliable food sources of vitamin K2 in the North American diet. Aged cheese is a possible source, but not if you're avoiding dairy products. The highest source of K2 is natto, a fermented Japanese-style soy product. Try finding that in a grocery store. It will be challenging, if not impossible. It's also an acquired taste for many, to say the least. That is what makes vitamin K2 an ideal nutrient to supplement. Pure Lab's vitamin K2 MK7 is a unique and effective K2 for a few reasons. First, it's exclusively MK7. That's because MK7 is more bioavailable. That means more absorbable from the gut into the blood than MK4. Pure Lab vitamins K2 MK7 consists exclusively of dry form MK7, the most efficiently absorbed and stable form of vitamin K2. But it's not as simple as choosing MK7. Ordinarily, vitamin K2 products easily bind to minerals already in the digestive tract, making them ineffective. Pure Lab Vitamins K2 MK7 is a unique dry crystalline form of K2 that is designed to resist this premature binding. How do we do that? Our MK7 is double microencapsulated. This makes it compatible with mineral containing supplements and foods. So you can get the benefits of vitamin K without compromising absorption of the other nutrients you consume. Most vitamin K on the marketplace is sourced from natto, a fermented soy product. Pure Lab avoids the use of top allergens like soy. Instead, we use only K2 vital MK7 Delta this is a vitamin K2 MK7 developed in Norway, manufactured in Germany, and sourced from non-GMO organic geranium and rose oils. So to confirm, Pure Labs K2 MK7 is 100% soy free. Now, another nutrient that not everyone knows is important for bones is vitamin C. It's required for production of collagen. Since collagen is the protein that makes up bone, Vitamin C deficiency negatively affects bone and tooth health. But when it's adequate, it enables better calcium absorption when taken together due to the naturally acidic nature of vitamin C. The problem with food sources of vitamin C is that cooking will destroy it. And not everyone is getting raw foods in their daily diet nowadays. Also consider that low carb diets tend to cut out most fruits. And for most people, fruit is the tastiest way to get their vitamin C. Keep in mind if you're a smoker, the damaging effects of toxic chemical exposure increases your vitamin C requirements. Pure Lab offers a supplementary vitamin C that is pure, clean, and corn-free. Most vitamin C is made from corn, the most common grain associated with hypersensitivity reactions. For this reason, Pure Lab vitamin C products are made from the starch of the cassava root, known as tapioca a food rarely associated with classic allergy. Our slow release vitamin C was designed to release vitamin C steadily through your day. Our unique formulation improves uptake and maintains blood levels for longer lasting benefits. We also have a powdered version, which has no added sweeteners or flavors of any kind. This makes it safe for diabetics. Recall that vitamin C is also needed for a healthy immune system and healthy circulatory system too. So you'll be helping more than just your bones. By now, it should be obvious that calcium cannot combat osteoporosis on its own. It takes a whole team of nutrients and body hormones 
plus an appropriate and therapeutic exercise program to do this. Let me summarize the nutritional support I've discussed today. I've talked about the importance of counteracting acidity in the tissues with an alkaline forming diet rich in fruits and vegetables. That means eating 8 to 10 servings daily. I've mentioned that supplementation of alkaline mineral salts is an easy way to achieve this, especially if you find you're not meeting this daily quota through food alone. I've outlined the importance of vitamin C, D, and K2, MK7 for bone health. Don't forget the obvious, getting adequate calcium through diet and supplementation of a calcium complex. I've given you a lot of information to consider when it comes to nutrition for bone density support. In summary, nutrition matters. Curbing dietary lifestyle induced hyperacidity through the strategy I've outlined can enhance the rate of building bone mass. Supplementation provides focused bone support with higher dosages of specific nutrient compounds. Realize that dosages are different in prevention or maintenance versus management. I hope you found this presentation interesting and helpful. At this time, I'd like to thank all our participating retail partners that helped promote this event. Most of them have specials going on for the next few days in support of this webinar. I'll now get ready to check if there are any questions coming in. Please just give me a moment and stay tuned. So we're just going to switch a few things around here. Thanks you all for the time. Uh, this is Andrea's uh, bone builder smoothie recipe. We'll leave that on for a few more seconds. Uh, Please keep in mind, everybody registered will receive a link to the recording of this webinar. It will also go up on our website in the webinar section uh, within the next two days. And then you can just review everything, uh, pause on slides or pause on the uh, Bone Builder Smoothie. So here we are. Thank you, Andrea. That was very good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think you already have a couple of questions uh, that came in uh, on email. So That's we're going right. to start with those and then I will check what comes in on questions over here. So yeah, go ahead. Excellent. All right, so we have a question from Patricia that came in by email just a couple weeks ago. And she asks, is supplementing with protein powder a good way to absorb more calcium when diagnosed with osteoporosis? Not exactly, Patricia. Remember protein, specifically collagen, is the building block for the lattice work that the minerals like calcium get attached to, right? They crystallize onto that. So that really is uh, why we, we want to consume protein to fortify and strengthen and maintain that lattice work, right? But also consider that the uh, bone density building exercises, the weight bearing exercises, yep. the uh, resistance training exercises, Impact. those things, yes, they actually help you um, build muscle. And when you're using those muscles that are made of protein in your diet, um, it actually will strengthen the bone density by stimulating those osteoclasts that you heard about. Blasts. Yes, osteoblasts. The, <laughs> the blasts are the builders. That's right. So B and B. And the yeah. clasts are the, there is no real connection that I made in my head, yeah. but the blasts are the ones that build the bones. So with That's impact, right. with any kind of impact, you tell those blasts inside yeah. the bones that they are supposed to work harder to make strong bones. Exactly, Cyrus. <laughs> All right, thank you, Patricia, for that great question. Uh, we also had a couple questions from Rosie, uh, who asked, um, she said she's read that too much vitamin D can suck the calcium out and make us brittle. Not exactly. Uh, however, if you take a lot of vitamin D and you're not necessarily uh, taking vitamin K, what we are concerned about is that the calcium uh, in your body actually won't go to bone. It, there will be some deposits, some calcium uh, calcification of soft tissues that happens, and, such as in the kidneys or the, the uh, heel bone or in the arteries, and we don't want that. And so I think it's really wise to supplement the vitamin K along with the vitamin D, especially if you're taking higher levels. May I interject there Sure. As well? I mean, I'm always a big, big advocate of uh, blood, blood work, testing. 
Um, there is no standard dose of vitamin D3 that I or anybody could recommend to all of you. Um, there's, it's really a very individual finding. It has to do with your daily lifestyle, with your daily exposure to sunlight, and how much of it, your skin type, your ability to produce vitamin D3 in the skin that is exposed to sunlight, and then the amount of D3 that you're consuming from dietary source and your supplemental source. So all these factors are individual. And for that reason, you really have to, especially when you're trying to optimi uh, optimize your, your vitamin D levels, you have to test more frequently in the beginning until you know that you, in the summer or the winter, when dosing this much vitamin D3 on a regular basis, that you then achieve this or that level, and that needs, uh, needs to be tested and, and, and verified. While you are, and while you're lasting within reference range, there's no risk of any kind. No, only if you actually, with overdosing of D3, reach levels way beyond the reference range, then there is a risk of kind of altering your calcium uh, bone supply. Uh, but it's, as Canadians, <laughs> very hard to reach unless you truly overdose long term. Exactly. Great. Okay, one more question from Rosie was that uh, she read that not combining, it's important not to combine iron and calcium together. Is this true? And yes, it is. However, say someone's taking a multivitamin. Typically, a women's multivitamin will have calcium uh, as well as some iron, especially a prenatal multivitamin, right? It'll have um, maybe 18 to 40 milligrams of iron compound. And so in, in, in that case, I always think, gee, how much of that iron is going to be absorbed when it's combined with all of those sometimes inferior forms of uh, minerals and, and so on. So it, say someone was pregnant and she was looking to maintain her bone density while she was building a new body, right, a new baby's body, then I, I'd suggest uh, in addition to the multi uh, prenatal that she do take a good quality calcium like the calcium hydroxyapatite calcium complex away from that multi and take an iron supplement should her blood results be found to yes. be uh, low in ferritin, okay, which is extremely common in women who are pregnant because their blood volume doubles when they're pregnant. So that increases the need for iron to help oxygenate tissues and of course uh, the fetus is uh, growing a body as well, right? So taking those separately always, you're absolutely right, Rosie, taking calcium and iron in quantity in therapeutic doses should be done at different times of the day. And iron should always be taken away from calcium On and calcium-containing foods as well. Yeah. Right? And also oftentimes away from uh, medication, especially thyroid medication. Uh, iron and thyroid drugs uh, do not go together. So we've got a growing list of questions coming in here. I'll start with the first one, and it's a good one already from June. Right. Uh, she's asking whether strontium is of value uh, as a bone builder. And the studies around strontium are pretty uh, straightforward and clear. Mm -hmm. I always explain it this way, that uh, strontium belongs to the same kind of column of elements within the periodic table. It's closely related to calcium. It has much higher molecular weight and, and uh, has, um, as a bivalent mineral, also high affinity towards the bone matrix but it's not part of our natural uh, metabolism. It would never kind of have to leave the bone again to help balance blood pH. So it kind of can go into the bone matrix and stay there and strengthen the, the bone structure without kind of being at risk of leaking or leaching out again when needed. So the, the research is, is quite strong that strontium uh, can be of benefit in uh, regaining bone density. Um, I dislike bone building formulations because they combine specific ratios of one over the other. And while you try to kind of achieve a certain dose of one of the ingredients in a bone building formula, you might then get too much of another. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we don't want vitamin no. K and vitamin D in the exactly. same product, right? Or calcium and right. D, and you want to reach yeah. maybe 5,000 units of vitamin D3 in a bone building formulation, and you would completely overdose right. calcium and suffer from constipation, muscle spasms, and all kinds of potential calcifications all over the body, which is what you do not want, which is why we always also argue that you should really kind of assess your dietary calcium intake and then supplement with, with a supplement to reach kind of the, the optimum range. If you blindly follow mainstream medicine recommendations of 1,500 milligrams of calcium, 
and then have a high calcium diet at the same time and you're ending up with 2000 milligrams, 2500 milligrams of calcium, you will suffer the consequences. No? So you got to find Absolutely. your balance and kind of make it fit to your needs. One more thing about the strontium, if I can add some uh, clinical experience. Uh, this is a, a good. Yeah. yeah, it's an in ingredient uh, that uh, I have used in bone uh, supportive protocols, nutritional protocols with my nutritional clients over the years. And uh, while I agree, uh, Cyrus says, you know, it, there's a lot of strong research yeah. there showing it's beneficial for um, actually improving bone density and strengthening bone. The thing is, the compliance is always poor. <laughs> uh, I get people on it and I explain to them and I say, look, uh, you'll take this uh, once or twice a day and you need to take it away from food away from calcium at least four to six you know six hours away yeah, it from complicated. it gets very complicated and I, when I saw that some of my uh, clients were getting up at four in the morning to take their strontium I realized yeah, uh, what am I much. doing is this really the best thing for them and often they just stop taking it and so they don't get the results that could be obtained if they were more compliant and it was easier to take well I mean compliance with anything we do is, is uh of the essence, you know. If uh, I always jokingly say, like uh, all these supplements, they only work if you t uh, they don't work on the shelf. No, <laughs> you got to take them. That's and right. uh, and also, I always kind of put in a grain of, of salt in so far that if you fully research the ideal intake schedule, you it becomes a full time job. So uh, there is most certainly a way of dosing two three times a day without going overboard with complications or with complexity. I also always say if, if it becomes too complex to, to follow a specific regime and you for that reason stop taking that regime, your bioavailability is zero. You know? So you got to make it also fit into your day, into your life, into your ability to follow a certain regime. You know? I would actually take, like to take the next sure, question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Holly is asking, how do we test for acid levels? And uh, well, technically we use pH paper or pH test strips, but Health Canada is cracking down on these products. We, Pure Love Vitamins, used to have a very good uh, dual field test strip available, but even though it just measures the pH in either saliva or urine, Health Canada kind of pulled the plug on, on these products because even though it's just lacmus paper or a color detergent test strip, uh, they argue this needs a medical device license. And uh, to get that, such a license for a pH uh, test strip, it's quite complex. Uh, so right now, the amount of the number of products in Canada available to test pH are dropping significantly. Uh, you might be able to get uh, to order pH test strips uh, out of the, from the US. If you do that, just look for a physiological pH paper, which tests the pH range between five and nine. You don't need pH paper for the like for the pool <laughs> where you measure One from, to like, 14. from zero to fourteen, yeah. which is the full pH range. Our bodies only function between five and nine, and so you can then kind of open up this portion of the pH range uh, and provide much better and easier uh, readable results. May I jump to the, the we missed one here. Um, yeah. uh, anonymous uh, asked about yeah. what, what can increase the activity of osteoblasts? Yeah. <laughs> Blast, the, the, the builders. builders. The B, B for building. <laughs> yes, yes, that was a, just a, a bit of a slip of the tongue there. Yeah. So yes, uh, osteoblasts, so what builds those? Well, um, again, you stimulate them through uh, consuming uh, the right foods. Um, something I didn't talk about in the seminar was that um, things like that contain what we call phytoestrogens, like uh, lignans in flaxseed, isoflavones found in beans and soy products. Um, those actually have been shown to stimulate the activity of osteoblasts. So does this weight bearing and resistance exercise as impact. well? Yeah, impact exercise. Trampoline. That, and this builds bone. <laughs> <laughs> and also, let's not forget, uh, well, hormones. 
hormones, yeah. i.e. your own estrogen and progesterone. Our bones, female bones, have a lot of estrogen and progesterone receptors on them. And in men, I mean, you have more testosterone receptors, but in, in both cases, male and female, you have the stimulation by those hormones when those hormones are present. And that is why I remember why some people, uh, many of us, uh, as we approach menopause, our bone density drops or declines more quickly because of the absence of those hormones that are no longer parking in those receptor sites on the bones to stimulate osteoblastic activity. Yeah. Yeah. So those are just a few. Okay. I'll take the next one. Uh, Sharon is asking if there is not one supplement that contains all these supplements that we just discussed. And then you would have a fixed combination product. It would also be a, either a very large number of uh, capsules to take, almost equivalent to the number of individual capsules, or it would be a big, very big uh, a capsule, like a horse pill, uh, or a few of those. But uh, the biggest uh, point against it uh, is the fixed combination, that you no longer have therapeutic flex. If, uh, for example, you're coming out of winter where you used high dose of vitamin D into summer and you're actually gardening in short pants and, and tank top or however free you are, <laughs> uh, you might drop down your vitamin D intake from wherever you went in the winter, 5, 7, 10,000 I use to maybe just 2,000 I use during the summer. And then how did you, if you had this fixed combination product, you would uh, fall short of all the other nutrients that you might want to maintain at the same level, like vitamin C, uh, one, two, or 3,000 milligrams per day. Calcium in the fixed throughout the year in the maybe 500 milligram range plus your dietary calcium and so forth. So one fixed combination multi-bone builder formula is from my point of view detrimental and not, doesn't give you what you need. My experience as a practitioner uh, and working in retail environments, I find out that the client and the customer doesn't always take the full dose recommended on the label. They look at the column that, that just says, you know, one capsule provides this, or actually they, they don't realize it says uh, 10 capsules provide these amounts. They think it's one capsule. We're a one capsule a day type society. Uh, and unfortunately that, that has come about and, and it really doesn't serve us well. Uh, who's going to take 12 or 10 capsules of one product a day, right? Well, but if you, on the other end, if, if five products, five different nutrients given, taken once or twice a day, you are at a similar kind of count per day. Well, but at least you have therapeutic flex. Yes, therapeutic flex. That's a very well, good point. And, uh, and there's some psychology around that, like uh, of, of having, you know, now I'm going to take this and then I'm going to take that and then this item and those things. And I, I find my clients have always felt very comfortable taking numerous things, generally, a few exceptions, of course, uh, numerous different supplements as opposed to one product that I've asked them to take 10 a day of. Okay, plus the cost of that initial, that one product can be co sometimes quite exorbitant, but realizing it's because they're trying to be all, be the be all end all. Yeah. Okay, I have a question here from Barbara, and I, I'm not fully clear what you mean, but uh, I'm going to read it here. If you are at the recommended dosage of 154D, I assume you, you refer to the blood level of 150 millimole per liter uh, for vitamin D3. Um, can those symptoms, those overdose symptoms occur? And I say no to that because the reference range that we're kind of working in is a statistic distribution of the healthy population. Um, many argue specifically for vitamin D3 that the reference range we're getting from Canadian labs is actually way too low mm -hmm. you know, because it kind of reflects the statistic distribution of the depleted Canadian population. You know? Uh, but to, to put this uh, into, into safe terms, um, in order to ach achieve toxic levels of vitamin D3, you would have to kind of achieve blood levels in the 1,500 millimole range mm -hmm. you know, and use those levels continuously for a few weeks or maybe even a month or two until you reach those toxic levels. So by dosing within the blood work reference range, you know, uh, you are extremely safe um, if you stay within that range. Um, and from my experience, I've seen blood work from, I don't know, maybe a thousand individuals during my 25 year uh, practice as a compounding pharmacist. Um, I've had patients that were using 10,000 IUs for practically years and did not even get outside of the reference range. Uh, 
But again, this is a very individual thing. You can't generalize that. And I believe that you have to start at a certain dose that you feel comfortable with. Um, and then at, at some point after a month or two, test your levels to see what you achieve. And then based on the outcome, dose potentially higher to be somewhere within the range. Personally, I aim for the upper percentile of the reference range because of the reason that um, this range reflects a deficient population. So uh, I think it's safe to be around between 100 and 150, just to answer that. There are a few questions coming in on this. Well, there's more. Uh, That's the, the way it uh, goes. We have six, 16 <laughs> outstanding uh, questions. Gosh, now. okay, we better catch so up. So I'll try and, be, uh, try, yeah. try and be brief. How about the role of boron? Well, boron seems to act a little bit like estrogen. So for women who are postmenopausal, it may be a good supplement to add into their regime. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, does vitamin D need to be mixed with oil to no. be absorbed? Absolutely not. No. This is one of my favorite myths. Uh, about vitamin D. Uh, again and again, people think, they tell me they think they need to get the vitamin D in an oil base, and that is simply not true. Um, it's The problem is with the oil-based products is that they are a little bit unstable. They don't have a very long shelf life because oil uh, is, is not saturated fat, it's a liquid oil, uh, unsaturated. So it tends to be vulnerable to damage by heat and light and oxygen. And oxidation. Yeah. And so we chose to have a dry form powder for this reason, so that it would have a longer shelf, like longer lasting benefits in On the your body. shelf. The On shelf life shelf. of the sealed bottle is tested. Yes. Mm -hmm. And most products have two to three years expiry. But as soon as you open the seal, break the seal and air gets in, the air and the oxygen within passes through the oil. It even passes through the soft, the oil-filled soft gel capsule. As a consumer, you think, oh, this looks like a, a film and it's completely wrapped and packaged. But oxygen as an atom is so small, it just passes right through and can oxidate vitamin D3 inside the oil. That's right. And, with, and then, uh, like seriously, like shelf life of the open bottle on your shelf can drop drastically. You know? mm -hmm. Well, the same for uh, liquids, right? There's this mythology around liquid vitamin D being better. And, oh, it's the uh, worst because <laughs> for each drop of D3 that you take out of the bottle, a drop of air rises <laughs> through the oil, you know? oxidating it. I dare to say that uh, if you, for example, buy a large family size D, D dropper bottle and you consume that slowly, after a few couple of months, there is no active D3 left in that because it's all oxidated. Right, yeah. exactly. So there's more on this one question. That was uh, a very intense, anonymous yeah, question. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what is your opinion of calcium ascorbate, 100 yeah. milligrams? So first of all, for all our viewers and listeners, calcium ascorbate is not actually a calcium compound that you would use for bone density support. It's actually a vitamin C. Yeah. So ascorbic acid, ascorbate, that's what it means. And calcium is used to buffer the natural mild acidity of uh, vitamin C. And by doing so, some people find that they have, uh, they can take larger doses without that uh, discomfort or, or diarrhea. Um, uh, so that is why some people use calcium ascorbate as a vitamin C well, supplement. If you do the molecular math, you can do that. But uh, it's about 10% of calcium in the calcium ascorbate, 90% calcium. So with each, with each gram of, uh, of calcium ascorbate, you're getting about 100 milligrams of calcium per dose. Then you, if you're kind of aware of that, you can use that as one of the sources of calcium next to diet and maybe other supplementation. But in order to get... 500 milligrams of calcium, you'd have to use 5 grams of calcium ascorbate. If that is your standard dose, fine, you know, but you need to do the math. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the calcium used in algae cal? Oh, yes, we have. Yes. And we have, uh, we won't comment on that no, brand. No, we do comment on that, actually. Uh, on that brand, yeah? Well, not on the brand, but, but on the algae source calcium, yes. Calcified Atlantic uh, seaweed? No, what is it? Calcified Atlantic seaweed, yes, CAS, exactly. I actually looked at this as a raw material for my brand, and uh, well, I kind of like the idea because you have a very broad distribution of trace minerals in this in this product. And it's vegan. And it's vegan, absolutely. But what uh, this these uh, manufacturers do not kind of show is that according, like, or it makes a lot of sense that this is algae out of our 
oceans and they contain what our oceans contain. And sadly, these oceans contain also a broad distribution of uh, heavy metals. And when you actually do the uh, full-on analysis of heavy metals with this product, you can, with your recommended daily dose, consume your daily allowance of lead every day. And that I stayed clear of. No? Like uh, our requirements of heavy metal content in all our products is much, much uh, higher or, or better than even what Health Canada uh, requires. And uh, calcified Atlantic seaweed does not, or algae cal, does not fit into that uh, 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 spectrum. So that was it for the anonymous questionnaire. What is the best source of calcium? Yeah, I think apatite. Very, very, otherwise I wouldn't have chosen it. Calcium hydroxyapatite. Yeah. Pure lab, calcium hydroxyapatite, right? <laughs> so here's anonymous, might be another anonymous. Um, why do you not mix K2 and D3? We answered that already, or Andrea answered that, because then you have one fixed combination and you cannot, you lose your therapeutic flex. Very simple, very straightforward. You can no longer dose up and down in D because you also dose up and down in K. What about the role of the microbiome in bone health? Yeah. Great question, because yes. as a holistic nutritionist, I believe we're not just what we eat, but what we absorb, right? And so uh, absorption is everything, right, yeah. after uh, intake. So there are many people with malabsorption issues. They may have a serious diagnosis like celiac disease or Crohn's disease, which can cause inflammation and damage to the surface area of the intestine, the small intestine that is responsible for absorption of minerals and vitamins for that matter, and protein, amino acids, right? And so uh, that, uh, of course, the microbiome most people believe is only in the colon or the large intestine, and that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, most of our microbiome is in there, but as we move up into the small intestine, we have a little bit uh, more alkalinity, uh, less acidity, so you see different species living there, and you can bet that they all play a role in supporting uh, all kinds of things, including neurotransmitter synthesis when it comes to serotonin, for example. So why would they not also play a role in uh, mineral absorption, nutrient absorption too? So. I think that's really important to foster and nourish uh, and support that microbiome through eating fermented foods, uh, perhaps using a, a supplementary good quality probiotic, right? Uh, there are lots and lots of options to yeah. support that microbiome besides eating fiber. Fiber, of course, is the food for those, those microbes. I'll take the next uh, survey is asking whether calcium should be taken with food or without uh, or away from tea. Um, it really... Um, for the calcium, it doesn't really matter. Calcium would be absorbed best on an empty stomach when it's fully exposed to gastric acid. It dissolves, gets absorbed. But it doesn't, like from like comparative studies, I think are not very clear on that, so it can be taken with or without food. Yeah. Your second part of your question, away from tea, is much more important because the tannins in tea, especially black tea, practically bind to any kind of mineral. So if you are trying to absorb minerals that includes calcium but also iron magnesium zinc copper you should actually have your tea a lot or far away from your mineral supplement because tannins in tea especially green tea herbal teas are not that dangerous unless you have a high tannic acid green tea like uwe ursi or there was one other one i i can't remember right now that also has high tannic acid content because then these tannins bind to the mineral and that complex mm -hmm. doesn't get absorbed, you're actually excreting it. No? So, and, and actually, I've had this again in the pharmacy. Um, one of my first questions, anybody dealing with iron deficiency is always, do you, are you a tea drinker? And many uh, extreme <laughs> uh, anemic individuals are, and, and, and it kind of explains this because if you drink tea, uh, throughout practically every hour of, of, of your day, then you will not absorb many minerals, period. No? You really have to then create a window of being tea-free, and within that window you take your, your supplements. Hope that answers that. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Should I take that? Sure, go ahead. Anonymous, probably another one. <laughs> <laughs> asks, uh, says, great presentation, thank you, thank you. Uh, how do you avoid um, calcium from lining blood vessels? No? 
uh, and there's a second part of the question as well. So K2 MK7 is the uh, traffic policeman in this case. There's um, good evidence that specifically the MK7 form is actually able to direct calcium from that is freshly absorbed over to vitamin D3 and into the muscles. There's some evidence that K2 MK7 is even able to degrade already existing plaque, no? meaning that it can actually grab calcium from uh, sclerotic linings uh, within the cardiovascular system and then bring the calcium elsewhere to where it's needed so that there is actually a chance of cleaning up your blood vessels with, uh, uh, with the use of K2 MK7. And then she's uh, anonymous, he or she is asking whether there is actually blood tests that would show you uh, how much K7, D3, C or strontium is needed. Uh, I can't answer that with one yes or no. Uh, there is, to my knowledge, no testing for K2, MK7. You could measure blood levels of C, but it's, uh, I've never seen that and it's also... Snapshot. Well, it's a snapshot, but also not uh, very valuable because you might as well just take a slow release vitamin C uh, every day to make up for your dietary uh, uh, shortcomings. There is, to my knowledge, no, no, no strontium blood test, but you can measure minerals in hair. Hair mineral testing, from my point of view, is the most valuable way of testing um, an average of your mineral supplies. Because um, if you take or if you provide a one centimeter sample of hair that is reflective of your nu nutritional supply of about approximately one month. And when it comes to D3, yes, you can measure plasma vitamin D3 levels, and it's highly recommended to do this frequently to uh, analyze your um, response to supplements and, and that you can figure out, okay, by using 3,000 units, I reach this level. By using, using 5,000 to 7,000 units, I reach this and that level. And then kind of determine what you need in the winter when there is practically no sun exposure. And do the same also in the summer to kind of measure your lifestyle and your average light exposure together with your supplementation. Okay, this All one's right. for you. Yeah, can you Christy asks, can you please address what osteopenia is, please? I just was diagnosed with this and don't have a lot of info. Right, so osteopenia is like uh, pre-diabetes is to diabetes. It's like a lower grade, of, uh, a low grade or, or a minimal amount of bone loss, but significant enough to be noted in the DEXA scan, the x-ray uh, that you had done of your lumbar spine and hips and so on, uh, which reads your bone density, uh, showed that your bone density was lower than normal for women of your race, age, and as sex being women so uh, that is a warning that uh, you need to start right away in building uh, your bone doing everything you can nutritionally lifestyle wise through the weight bearing exercises um, to to help uh, we want to slow down the rate of bone loss right can we stop it and uh, entirely in some instances we can but in osteopenia this is your 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 last chance you know before you get to the osteoporosis stage which is more like uh, a much lower um, level uh, uh, or say uh, a, a lower a level of, of bone density that has <coughs> dropped now to what is a two standard deviations below the mean or the average yeah, well, yeah. there is a range and yeah then, then you can be diagnosed as osteopenic yeah, so osteopenic is, is usually less than minus two, and uh, yeah. I think minus two is the osteoporosis. So you're not quite there yet. That's good news. You're on your way. You're on your way, though. <laughs> so not so now it's the time to get active That's and right. start we're, make changes. We're so. so glad you're here, and yeah. we hope this gives you some information to, uh, to take to your uh, main uh, healthcare practitioner and uh, to consider working with other practitioners and starting some uh, supplementation if, if you feel comfortable with that. Okay, this one is for me. It's a drug-related question. Anonymous uh, is asking whether raloxifene supports bone health. Um, a drug, I mean, you're asking me as a pharmacist, and I'll answer you as a pharmacist, but a special kind of pharmacist. Um, when we're talking about bone health, I believe that truly uh, the components that our 
biochemistry normally uses are the tools to maintain health. A drug can have a specific impact on our bones and will potentially treat one of the many mechanisms specifically. Um, this, like I've dispensed raloxifene, alendronate, uh, actonel, didrocal, and all the other bone building uh, drugs for 25 years. And I believe I have never seen an individual that actually gained bone density by using these drugs alone. No? I have seen big changes when individuals started, started to make lifestyle changes, dietary changes, and especially pH changes. No? And from my point of view, actually learning about your body pH is and, and addressing a potentially chronic hyperacidic situation with diet and potentially supplementation, like with the Alcapure, um, that is the fastest way to actually regain bone density. Because if you manage to balance blood pH properly, your bones no longer have to leak out their alkaline minerals into blood circulation to help balance acidity, because you're doing this like as, at grassroots level. You're changing your, body, your body's tendency to be acidic uh, with lifestyle and diet, uh, dietary changes, stress management, and maybe supplementation. So in essence, <laughs> to give you a straightforward answer, um, it is up to you to decide whether you want to use drugs and follow the recommendations of mainstream medicine or whether you want to take uh, um, the work into your own hands and, and start the natural um, parameters that are known to improve bone density. Um, I've worked with pH balance for about 15 years now and whenever I manage to convince a prescription drug customer to maybe after using these drugs for five, seven years without much or many results um, to actually implement specific changes, all of a sudden bone density goes up. You know? um, in general, I would think that the data we see from um, prescription drugs is more of a halt, halting the status quo as is. You're kind of trying to, or these drugs help you maintain your status quo as it is right now. I have rarely seen bone density uh, uh, to rise on, on these drugs. But I also have to say this is my personal uh, view on this matter and I'm, I'm sure that there's many doctors that would jump down my throat right now, but it's my observations. You know? Can I, I'd like to answer that one there. Uh, another anonymous uh, asks. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, about, she says, uh, or, besides soya to help build osteoblast activity due to allergies, what are other options? Mm. Great question, anonymous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing a lot of people don't know. It's that beans, legumes, beans and lentils, all contain phytoestrogens. That is, plant chemicals that mimic estrogen in a very mild way. Um, they tend to stimulate stimulate the uh, beta receptors for estrogen in bone, for example. So uh, that's kind of exciting to know that you don't have to eat soy because most people allergic to soy can eat other legumes. Also red clover. There are red clover sprouts and there are some uh, supplements out there that contain red clover isoflavones that would have the same offering and same benefits. Okay. Um, Is that it? Um, Oh, I, 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 I deleted it. Oh, okay. I thought there was a second part to that one. Well, I'm sorry for that, but we have, some, we have still 24 we have so questions. Many. Apologies. So I'm trying to keep it clean here yeah, and uh, move us My forward. My editor here is. I edited it too quickly. I'm sorry. Um, I think we answered the exercise things. Impact, impact, impact is what builds uh, yeah, we, bone. Uh -huh. Even uh, walking with a backpack that oh. has about 10 pounds of I books. Have another, another exactly, in, in your, weight. Yeah. So there you can buy weighted vests yes. that you wear uh, over your clothes for starting for half an hour a day and then work your way up. Yeah. You can also take a backpack that sits on your hips That's you know, right. or, uh, and partially on your shoulders and put uh, some heavy stuff into that and walk around with it. You can buy, um, even though like wrist weights mm -hmm. and ankle weights are definitely good for your muscles, but they don't increase uh, the impact onto your bones as much as weight on your upper chest. Mm -hmm. no? um, but yeah, weighted vests or uh, weights are hugely important. 
trampoline bouncing. You use your own body weight, but increase the G-force that kind of uh, uh, works down your spine into your pelvis and hips right. uh, and, and, and hip... Um, uh, Flexors? No, the, 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 the muscle, the bone that always breaks, the femur. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is, these are all the exercises right. that, that uh, would right. benefit that. And you don't have to jump very high. You don't have to be a circus nope. performer. No. <laughs> okay, it's not about how high you jump. It's just getting off the trampoline, the bounce, yeah. bounce, bounce, which is also excellent for lymphatic support. Totally. Lymphatic pump drainage. It exactly. Pump it up because the lymphatic vessels and, and fluid doesn't have a pump like the heart. It pumps the blood. Yeah. So the muscles are your way to pump that fluid around, clean the, the tissues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's one from Maggie. And I just to, in the, in the spirit of shortening things, Maggie yeah. came in late. So Maggie, I have to tell you, please wait for the recording to come through and watch the presentation that Andrea did uh, from the beginning. We can't just repeat the whole thing over again. So I hope you understand that. Uh, Dorothy, uh, she's a 71 active pickleballer. Uh, she does six hours of pickleball, which is amazing because you have these stopping and running ah. and impact on, on hard surface all the time. And you also do aqua fit twice a, twice a week, mm -hmm. which is good for muscles and also has some kind of impact, even though your weight in water is like reduced. Res huh? Resistance too, right? To water. Resi muscle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and maybe also bone a little bit if you mm -hmm. move quickly through the water, not leisurely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and there's all kinds of drug questions here that I can't, they're way too like specific. So maybe Dorothy, I encourage you to email me uh, at info at purelifevitamins.com and I can go through all that list uh, specifically and answer all these questions. So yeah, info at purelifevitamins.com. Uh, there's Maggie, she says she has thoughts whether MK4 is preventing fractures. Uh, uh, research seems to be showing that it can do that at high mm -hmm. doses. Yeah. Uh, but in Canada, the, the dosing that I am allowed to put into capsules is very regulated. You're absolutely right. It's basically the RDI, right? The recommended daily intake. It's yeah. not beyond that. Whereas with a yeah. lot of nutrients, they allow larger doses like yeah. B vitamins. They only need one or five milligrams a day. But uh, RDI to prevent deficiency, but optimal levels, they let you go much higher. In so, MK4? So, no, with vitamin B complex. I'm just oh, giving B. a, a comparative. Oh, no, but this year is yeah. MK4. No? Yeah, but um, the K, it doesn't, uh, they don't go above that RDI when they, no. for what they let you put yeah. in the, the it's bottle. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, but I mean, as a manufacturer, I cannot get the license for a product that surpasses these maximum ranges. No? So my, uh, first of all, I chose to use MK7 because it has the longest half-life in our circulation. It's the most bioactive and best absorbed kind. And it's the one that actually reduces uh, calcifications already existing in, within the cardiovascular system. Uh, and the highest dose possible in Canada is 120 micrograms. Yeah. No? So yeah, you can dose if you're following research um, that uh, uses like higher, more therapeutic dosing, then you can use that that way. But in Canada, you will not find a higher dose K2, MK7 right. or K2, MK4. No? Um, sadly, I wish I could just dose freely the way I want, but uh, it's, uh, it's not happening. No? Francesca asks an interesting question. Since being diagnosed with osteoporosis, I have developed high iron. Is there a connection? Well, well if uh, let's think, think about it for a think second. Think about it. I, I, is Fran Francesca, if you were on a medication, I wonder, would that have an impact? Uh, well, I mean, hemochromatosis is the only condition that kind of generates high iron or high ferritin yeah. levels, which is usually connected to uh, in some kind of uh, spleen or liver uh, condition. So that should be checked. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure your doctor is already doing that. Um, um, to achieve high iron from diet alone is practically yeah. impossible unless your iron reservoirs are spilling back into the blood. Hemochromatosis is a very complex condition, very hard to understand. It's sometimes mind-blowing how anybody can make or have that much ferritin in circulation yeah. and where it's coming from and, and long term. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the best possible treatment is uh, donating blood uh, to actually reduce your blood volume by, by half a liter and donating that, anybody receiving your blood will be 
super happy to get it <laughs> no? because of the high ferritin in it and you will uh, reduce and drop uh, your ferritin levels accordingly but yeah it's it's not as not meant to be funny but uh, it's uh, it's a complex condition and it needs to be investigated in in in, in great detail no? oh yeah so that's a Lots hormone question yeah, yeah. Uh, hormone replacement therapy or BHRT bioidentical hormone replacement therapy was my uh, one of my specialties for many years and absolutely it's one of the best ways to not only maintain uh, bone health but also mental health uh, sleep energy focus all these potential uh, symptoms of um, um, menopause or perimenopause can be alleviated with it it's a complex therapy that needs that requires frequent testing and retesting of your hormone levels so that you're not ending up in overshooting ranges of uh, whatever you use especially in the beginning when you start using a bioidentical progesterone bioidentical uh, estrogen uh, whether it's whether it's biased or triest uh, in whatever form you choose whether it's oral transdermal um, or, or um, lozenges are often used as well it all needs to be adjusted and fine-tuned very very closely there's sadly not many doctors um, doing this kind of therapy anymore it used to be hipper in the early 2000s but many of those doctors meanwhile retired uh, in Ontario I believe that naturopathic doctors now have prescribing rights for some of the hormones not all of them testosterone is excluded um, and, and there's many of them specializing in BHRT and work closely with compounding pharmacies so yeah uh, from a um, bone building and bone maintenance point of view uh, specifically if you're experiencing or going through um, a menopause right now there's definitely uh, some benefits of doing hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. with caution uh, do you want to talk about calcium in the heart? I could, but uh, do you have anything to contribute about that? And I can add. Well, I always like I'm. I just came out with a calcium hydroxy appetite because I wanted to kind of complete the line, uh, my mineral line, and have it available. I chose, from my point of view, the best uh, bioabsorbed and and most alkaline type of calcium salt. But I can't say I'm a big fan of calcium, even though it's important mm -hmm. for our bodies. And it's one of the most omnipresent minerals, uh, per, like period. But it's also uh, the only mineral that is still adequately present in our diet. And I explain that, I've explained this many times in, in previous webinars. Uh, first of all, calcium is the most abundant mineral in the crust of our, of our planet. Um, and farmers also keep a close eye on or, or um, no farmers use it frequently on their fields to manage the pH of the soils because they know if the acidity of uh, of in the soil starts rising then the yield of their crops goes down and that is a direct has direct impact on on their bottom line so they use a freely available and and cheap uh, a supplement which is lime and put that back onto the soils to manage the pH and with that the yield goes up again which means all these crops that that are grown on Canadian soils and, 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 and fields do usually contain adequate amount of calcium so a calcium supplement is is from my point of view not as important as for example a magnesium supplement unless you need it so then back to the question of your heart Calcium in our biochemistry is the contractive mineral. It makes the muscle contract. And it needs magnesium, on the other hand, to relax again. There is no contraction without relaxation, because otherwise you're looking at a cramp. And if that <laughs> happens in the heart, not a good situation to go through. No? So while I believe that we can like normally the average Canadian can manage calcium intake with diet alone but for example if you are a vegan and you avoid dairy products altogether 
then you should pay attention to at least consume adequate amounts of dairy substitutes, which are usually calcium fortified, like rice milk or soy milk or even oats, oat milk. They usually have added calcium in them. Uh, consume nuts and seeds, even though I always argue that nuts and seeds that we can buy today are grown on soils that usually are mineral depleted because they are monocultured on these fields. Mm -hmm. If a crop is known to have a high amount of a certain mineral, the crop is not making that mineral. The mineral is an element that's either in the ground or not. And if you've grown the same crop over and over and over in a monocultured plantation, then you can rely on the fact that there's none of that mineral left in that soil. No? And uh, so then, anyways, I'm, I'm getting, I'm drifting away <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Um, but all this means that I think we got it. We cannot follow mainstream medical recommendations on calcium blindly. We have to factor in our diet, where we live, what kind of food we consume, and what the potential calcium content is to then say I need extra. And when you take extra calcium, you gotta also take extra magnesium to provide balance. Yeah. Huh? Otherwise, your heart gets tighter and you get more angry and more constipated over time. Huh? All um, right, I think we answered John's question fairly well about how much MK7 should be consumed per day, 120 or one, 240 micrograms, while we, we talked about yeah. the dosage allowed to be used in a capsule form, yeah. the maximum dosage is 120. But uh, your health pra practitioner might actually recommend a higher amount, yeah. so you can always uh, go in, uh, to them to, yeah. for advice. Also depends on body weight a little bit, like yeah. a 70 pound uh, a woman uh, might be sufficient uh, to take just one a day. Mm -hmm. A 240 pound man might take two a day, maybe even three. You know, like, That's uh, a good point. <laughs> yeah, weight really does matter. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. In that respect. Okay, I'll do this one. Maggie asks, is calcium carbonate a good absorbable form at all for bone health or is it considered poor? Well, we consider it not optimal to say the least, uh, mainly because it's so alkaline and it requires so much stomach acid to be absorbed. So it's acting kind of like a fire extinguisher in your stomach. So it's something you, if you take, you definitely don't want to take with food because it's going to alkalize your stomach contents and prematurely, right? That's not supposed to happen until you're later in the digestive tract. The food is in the duodenum, part of the small intestine, alkaline there is fine but not in the stomach and so it means that you it can may interfere with the absorption of other important minerals that require acid like zinc and iron right and so no we don't love calcium carbonate it can be constipating as well isn't that yep. right cyrus Very. Yeah. yeah because it, because it's poorly absorbed because when you have to imagine what's not absorbed from the gut into the blood stays behind in the gut yeah. affecting the gut and calcium is contractive so if you have a contractor inside, like wandering <laughs> through the gut, you will contract the gut and cause constipation. Yeah. Not to mention, even though calcium carbonate is uh, what 40% elemental calcium, yep. right, by the way, and so a lot of people get fooled by that and they go, oh, it's cheap. Oh, look, I'm getting more calcium per capsule or tablet than any other brand, right, uh, or other type, rather. And so they might be getting 600 milligrams per capsule, but how much of that is actually absorbed? Exactly. So it really... And how many side effects do you get from that? Yeah, and well, so it's not always about you know how much you can stuff into a capsule it's about quality and how well you absorb yeah so we're working the, the numbers down here mm -hmm. i think we got to draw the line here at about eight o'clock we have 10 minutes left so we'll just go the the questions seem to get shorter so that's a good thing mm -hmm. uh, holly is asking about the right type of magnesium for best absorption for bone health I mean, that's a pretty straightforward answer here. Uh, there's really nothing that compares to magnesium glycinate, not just for bone health. It's all about bioavailability to get the magnesium from the gut into the blood. Uh, as soon as it's in the blood, it's no longer traveling as glycinate. It's actually bound to blood proteins like albumin anyways. So the key feature is the absorption step to get as much as possible in. And there the glycinate is truly the, the best form. It's our best selling product with good reason. It, uh, and, and ours is actually, I hear this time and time again, 
when people kind of uh, travel and they have to buy something else uh, elsewhere, they, don't, they couldn't get the, the magnesium in the brown bottle, and uh, even at equivalent dosages, they didn't get the same results. So, mag glycinate, most uh, definitely the way to go. Here's another prescription drug question. Uh, Ricky is asking if you are on actinol, which is uh, resedronate, uh, a, a generic name, uh, as a medication for osteopenia, should you still use the recommended supplements? I think absolutely yes. Um, first of all, they do not uh, interact with resedronate. I believe that you will not see uh, rising bone density with that drug alone anyways. Um, you need to support your own biochemistry, your own metabolism, your osteoblasts as much as possible to actually build bone. Building bone requires materials and that's proteins, collagen, calcium, magnesium, all the trace minerals and, and building factors. No? So definitely consider that including also exercise, lifestyle changes, activity, activity, activity and so forth. So yes, you should start using such a, a regime. Yeah, we did cover that. Yeah, Holly asked about the right kind of calcium. I mean, that's the hydroxyapatites uh, with, for many reasons, specifically because of its uh, pH status. And John, by the way, hi John. John uh, is running the show at Well, Well, Well next to Tina in St. Catharines. Uh, I always do a shout out because you're always there and you always ask good questions. Thank you very much. He's asking, would Alka Pure prevent osteoporosis? I believe so, for the very simple reason. If you, as the average adult, are exposed to average levels of stress and the average Canadian or North American diet, you are chronically hyperacidic. That means your blood and lymph system is on the acidic side, a pH levels below seven. And in this state, the body needs to manage acidity. And it can do that, one of the three mechanisms of doing that is to mobilize alkaline minerals from bone and muscle reservoirs, bring them back into circulation to balance blood pH. So if you're chronically acidic, you will chronically lose alkaline minerals from your reservoirs. And that in this state, you can supplement with alkaline minerals as much as you want. While your bones are still spilling their mineral content, why should supplemental calcium or magnesium go at the same time, go back into the bones? It's not happening. You know? So by helping maintaining blood pH or, or systemic pH to be around the neutral point, you right away stop the leaking or leaching of alkaline minerals from bone and muscle reservoirs. They can stay there. So you're halting the progression of demineralization. And if you then at the same time, while you maintain uh, physiological pH around the neutral point, then supplement with the right minerals in the proper dose and vitamin C and vitamin D3 and K2 and K7, you can then actually bring minerals and proteins and collagen back into the bone and increase bone density. Yes. Alka Pure or pH balance or also sometimes called alkaline therapy I think is the answer to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> can we consult with you for a fee? Yes, we. <laughs> I mean, we, we can uh, consult with, with me. you. Not with me. I don't do it anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm still a, a you know a clinical nutritionist, so sure, so shoot me an email. I'd be happy to set something up with you. Yeah. Uh, and then Grace asks about all the supplements you mentioned. Is there any you shouldn't take at the same time? No, that's the beauty of the uh, products that we were talking about. They're all designed to be taken together for best results. Right? Uh, you don't have to worry about um, incompatibilities between them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, natokinase better than K2 for clearing arteries. Well, natokinase is a very interesting uh, enzyme. It uh, comes from natto as well, from fermented soy. Um, should be used at fairly high doses. Is somewhat off the market in Canada as far as I recall. I think Health Canada has drawn the uh, the licenses there, and it is still available in the states. But I could be wrong there. I think you're right. It's yeah. uh, I don't think it's so. And once you get it, it has to be used at fairly high doses. Mm -hmm. 
and is certainly worth a try, maybe even in combination with K2MK7. Huh? So yeah, natokinase, uh, I think from, from the research I've seen, is very promising, but Health Canada is not helpful. Um, so we did that. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this one here is certain strains of micron can be result with for fee. Okay, we did that. Sorry, I'm just one? I'm just catching up. How about Prolia? That's a drug. Oh, that's the injectable yeah. uh, uh, osteoporosis drug. Um, actually, I have to admit, when I hung up my lab coat, that's when Prolia kind of came out, and I have since then not necessarily uh, read the books and and studies on it. At that time the research showed to be very promising. You know? uh, it's only given, is it once a month or once every three months? You wouldn't know. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, can't, I don't have anyone on, on um, it, so. It's like a depot injection, and uh, it actually, as far as I recall, but please don't quote me on that, it, it, has, it interferes with the activity of osteoblasts. It either blocks the activity of the osteoclasts, or improves the activity of, of the blasts, the builders. But um, I think it's, it's even especially only recommended uh, uh, in, in more drastic cases of osteoporosis. Um, I would most certainly recommend nutritional support and, and lifestyle support at the same time anyway. But I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not up to date here. Huh? So I, I apologize for not giving you a straightforward Oh, that's a nice one, yes. Mm -hmm. Mary is asking if K2 can interfere with blood thinner medications. Thank you for that question. So the K, the vitamin K that is commonly referred to as interfering with, with blood thinners is K1. You know? K2 has barely any activity towards uh, uh, the coagulation system of the blood, even though there is still uh, an issue. But this issue is only... Uh, referring to Coumadin or Warfarin as uh, the only old-school blood thinner that still requires INR testing. All the modern blood thinners that are on the market right now, so everything except um, Coumadin and maybe aspirin has no interaction with K2MK7 whatsoever. You know? And uh, so they can be safely taken in, in combination with any kind of uh, modern blood thinner you might be on. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Uh, Madeline is asking whether we would recommend strontium instead of calcium. No, uh, it can be an add-on. You know? um, I think that you, again, like when you look at the big shelves of supplements in the health food store, you, I think, from my opinion, you always have to distinguish. Uh, you can sort these products into two groups those nutrients that actually are part of our biochemistry you know, and those that have a potential effect on us. That's right. you know, they exert some effects on specific metabolic pathways yeah. or there are herbs that have an effect on us because of certain ingredients inside the herb. You know. So when I work about, talk about nutrients, those are <laughs> vitamins that are naturally part of our biochemistry and that are potentially not present in sufficient amounts in our diet. You know? And those we need to provide, whether through diet or supplementation. You know? That's up, up to you practically, but also not necessarily up to you because some of these nutrients are practically no, no longer present in our diet. You know? So then there's really no way around supplementation. And strontium is not an essential mineral as no. far as we know. It, it's it's a beneficial one. perhaps based on the studies, yeah. but it's uh, not something that's been proven to be essential for our health. So it's an add-on. Yeah. 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 Sylvie's asking whether we would take Alcapure with calcium supplement together. No. And a, a very good question. Thank you. That brings yeah. me, that reminds me to, to emphasize something. And then there's a second part that is also good, but let me answer this first. Alkapure is an alkalining supplement. If you're using calcium at the same time, you're kind of you're causing troubles. No? I think uh, while you can take calcium with or without food, Alkapure needs to be taken on an empty stomach for a very specific reason. If you would use Alkapure right before, during, or right after a meal, you would neutralize gastric acid that your body just made to receive the meal and to process 
proteins, fats, and carbs, and to absorb alkaline minerals. Now, because the acidity is essential to keep these minerals dissolved and with that bioavailable. So if you would neutralize the gastric acid, you also would just, your meal would just sit there and you would uh, not digest it properly and you wouldn't benefit from all these nutrients, you know, which is why you would take AlkaPure usually an hour, hour and a half after a meal when, when practically the stomach is empty again. So best times for AlkaPure is 10 o'clock for most people, which is like between breakfast and, and, and lunch, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which is between lunch and dinner, or bedtime is also a good um, time to take AlkaPure. I have had quite a few people, uh, customers, that always tell me that they, when they have to get up to pee at 3 a.m., that's when they take one of their two Alcapure doses because that's truly away from, from meal times yeah. and, and uh, uh, that's it's a good time to take uh, that. And then the second part of Sylvie's question was whether calcium can be taken together with MK2 plus vitamin D at the same time. If the K2 and, and, and D3 are oil-based formulations, then you cannot because the K2 would bind to calcium and this calcium K2 complex will no longer be absorbed. Our K2 MK7 is dry crystalline and it is double micro encapsulated. That means the raw material already comes in micro particles which have two layers of protection around them so that the K2 can practically is protected against binding to calcium and other minerals already in the gastrointestinal tract, in the stomach or the, the duodenum or the small intestines. Because this bound complex would no longer absorb. You know? So then you're buying a, a, an expensive combination product and because you're providing calcium at the same time, the, the bioavailability of this K2 MK7 or K2 MK4, whatever it is, is practically disrupted by the presence of calcium at the same time. By using the double micro-encapsulated form, you can take those two together. That's right. Huh? That's why you chose it, right? Yeah. Excellent. So okay. we're coming, coming to an end. end. Uh, someone asks here, uh, first they compliment us for both great sources of Thank information. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, how about flax and celery seeds and sesame seeds to support estrogen? Sure. So uh, flax, definitely. Uh, sesame, definitely. But hear this. <laughs> Uh, it's very important that you grind those seeds. If you don't, they act as fiber. You won't extract any uh, nutrients uh, from them typically, so especially the minerals. I know you're looking for phytoestrogens, the isoflavones, the lignans actually in the flax, but um, make sure it's ground up, okay? So you can grind it yourself, keep it in the freezer, or you can pre-purchase already uh, ground seeds, okay, to, to get um, more access, more surface area exposure to those phytoestrogens there. Okay, and this is interesting here. Carrie and Maggie both looked up the T scores um, mm -hmm. for us to share. So anything uh, between one and two and a half is so called low, bon low bone density and determined osteopenia, and anything above two and a half is uh, practically then considered osteoporosis. Huh? So these two we have, we're Thank coming, you. we're coming <laughs> down to... Yeah. How about it? this, about the men question here? Now that's John again, he always has questions what? like that. John's asking, uh, why do men not need estrogen to prevent osteoporosis? Because men have testosterone. Yeah. Uh, women have testosterone too, but in much lower uh, levels. So what's testosterone for men is estrogen for women. That's right. Simple as that. You know? And uh, uh, the bones probably in men have more uh, testosterone receptors, would they not? To some extent, and also I would think um, that there's also, I think, a connection between osteoblast activity and estrogen mm -hmm. and osteoblast activity and testosterone. Right. You know? um, some men, of course, still are at risk of osteoporosis absolutely. if they have absorption issues or they've been taking corticosteroid medications or antacids for a long time. Or they have low tes testosterone. Or low testosterone absolutely. and, of course, fine bone structure, tiny, you know, a petite bone structure could be another risk factor, just like with women. We did the celery seed, right? Yeah, done. 
And then here is Anonymous asking whether, oh, that's a good question to a pharmacist. No? If Alcapure is past the expiry date, is it still effective? Like from a pharmacist point of view, I cannot answer this with a yes. From a manufacturing point of view, I know how good my raw materials are. And I mean, unless we're talking about like five years expired, uh, I would say no. But if you're just uh, beyond the expiry date, I would have no concerns at all. The four main salts in Alcapure are stable and, and do not deteriorate. But I mean, uh, you would have to draw the line at some point. And vitamins would be a different story. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Sure minerals, in general, you can say minerals, they don't, well, I mean, an amino acid salt of a mineral can, the amino acid portion can decay, the mineral cannot. No? So you'd always get at least the mineral. No? Uh, oh, Ruth is well, thanking well. us for our expertise. Mm -hmm. And Ruth, you, you came in late, so yeah, wait for the link by email or check the website for the latest, uh, for the uh, when once the recording gets uploaded. Well, Madeline says natokinase is available in Canada. Okay, great. And thank Polia you. Polia is giving every six months, Come and Donna it. Nicholson had d dug that information out as well. Thank you for your Thanks support. for your help, yes. <laughs> and we're at the last uh, question here. It's not even a question. Oh, it's, it's not even a question. Compliment. Anonymous. <laughs> uh, thank you for a great informative session. Could listen all night. You're a wealth of information. Thank you for, thank for you the time. Thank you for attending, and we, still, for we still have 50 people listening, so this must have been a success. A success. Yeah. Thank you Kay. very much for your questions. Great questions, yes. everyone. Yes. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in uh, June when I'll be presenting on uh, nutritional for support for diabetes. Yep. And uh, Cyrus, you're invited what, what's, too. What's the date? What's the, date? Uh, G G the last Wednesday in June, I think it's the 28th. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. June 28th. So stay stay tuned for that information and uh, hope to see you there. Good. Yes. Great job. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Cyrus. Bye. Good night.